Welcome to Pines and Plains Libraries Oral Histories. I hope you guys enjoy this video. Let us know in your comments if you want to know about anything else locally or if you have a contact that we could go and get some oral history from somebody. Let us know. This is going to be an oral history from Mr. Morris Ververs and I hope you enjoy it. Do you, do you still have some time we could maybe I could ask you kind of how Simla was when you were growing up and kind of, <laughs> we have another history that we had um, from Mr. Lindley and um, Tim Miller asked him oh. his questions and he, he went through and he just kind of said, you know, you know, how old are you? When were you born? And mm -hmm. did you grow up here? And they went through the whole thing and it was kind of neat to listen and hear Mr. Lindley's description of Simla yeah. and, and how, you know, how he got back and forth to school and, you know, just, just went through the day to day yeah. life, but for when he was growing up and I was fascinated because it's so different from how my kids are going to school. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah. so I, you know, can we, can we do that? Well, yeah, I could start with uh, my experience with Simla, which started uh, basically I was uh, going to school at Central School. Mm -hmm. Do you know where that is? Mm -hmm. uh, the building was still there. Well, when I first started the school there, there were two uh, wood structured buildings. One was uh, grades one through four, and the other was five through eight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to school there, uh, grades one, two, and three. and. Uh, Back in those days, they had community involvement, and uh, when it was my dad's turn to do stuff, he and I showed up early at the schoolhouse, and we broke the ice on the, the water pail. Everybody drank out of the same dipper, and we took the dipper and broke the ice, and then we we fired up the pot belly stove so it would be warm when the students got there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Maver Million was my teacher, a really good teacher. In fact, she painted that picture right back there. Okay. And uh, my mom had her do that. I, I took that picture when I was going to school at the University of Alaska. But uh, May Vermillion, uh, she would have like fourth grade recitation. And they'd all go up. Uh, and there were probably maybe 15 kids at the most in that room. And uh, But while they were doing that, they all went up and sat on a recitation bench, which most people don't even know what the heck that is nowadays. But, <clears throat> but they kind of did a lesson, and she walked them through certain things. But grades... Uh, one, two, and three were seated in the back, and we were listening, and we were learning. <laughs> learning their stuff. Yeah, learning their stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, they uh, they tore those school houses down, and uh, my Uncle Leo, Charlie's dad, mm -hmm. uh, built the new schoolhouse, which is still standing, and it's used as a church today. Mm -hmm. And where is that? Uh, it's uh, about two or three miles north of Cooch Tour. Okay. All right. But, uh, yeah, and, uh, and I went to school there for until uh, uh, I was in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've heard me tell this story that oh, I was yeah. the smartest kid in my class. For you were. First, for your grades. And Bernie always said, well, you're also the dumbest kid. Well, yeah, that's true. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we should point out you're the only kid. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, and when I was in seventh grade, we had, after May Vermillion, I had two really pretty, uh, not very good teachers. And... Uh, one lady was really nice, but all she ever did was read to us, and we didn't have to do anything. And, uh, and then uh, the next year, in the sixth grade, uh, I had an alcoholic that uh, she would open up her drawer to get her bottle that she brought to school with her every day. And I learned absolutely nothing that year. And then, uh, and I, I, I've told this story to most everybody, but I've heard it a million times. But she's not here. It's okay. <laughs> but we, uh, we had a, uh, Don Malone. Mm -hmm. was the guy's name and he was uh, a pretty young guy of course I was in the seventh grade so who knows uh, but I would guess him in the early 20s but uh, Don Malone uh, actually changed my life because he he taught us ping pong basketball and uh, he would tell us he said okay if you can pick out we all had uh, pocket dictionaries and he said if you can pick out one word uh, that I can't give you the answer to or the meaning of, uh, you'll get a free recipe or uh, recess. So we were all 
really uh, challenged, but I mean, he did that kind of thing. And every every day at the end of the school day, uh, before the buses came, we would go down and uh, help him with his workout and you know doing the uh, bar press and, and all that. But he was just he was really f uh, physically fit and. Uh, but his his intellect, I mean, we were saying things like, "Well, them their pencils." I mean, we didn't. We were really hicks from the sticks, and he really, I don't know if he got everybody out of it, but he sure got me out of it. And uh, mm -hmm. I've told Verna many times I would like to uh, run him down and let him know the impact that he had on my life. But then they closed the school uh, when I was uh, starting the eighth grade, and then I was bused to Selma, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I also, during that year, um, I, I had, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll start saying it was my first paid job, and I was in the eighth grade, and uh, Perry Hilton, that's, that's Perry's dad and mm -hmm. Perry's granddad, uh, was shocking feed and wanted to know if I wanted to help. Oh, I was tickled to help. So I, I went, uh, and I had, it was muddy. It was kind of like in the middle of, maybe December or something like that. And we were, me and, and several other guys were out there shock and feed. And that night, uh, I got, I went home and uh, I was, I was sick, really deathly sick. And uh, I just wanted to be in a bedroom with no light and no sound. And, uh, and I was peeing blood. Mm. And, uh, Mom and Dad took me to the doctor the next day, and Dr. Strong, who started his uh, practice in Sumlum, uh he was in Springs then, but he, uh, he said, well, there, there's no doubt here. He has uh, nephritis, Bright's disease. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we didn't know it, I didn't know it until years later, that Bright's disease followed strep throat. Mm -hmm. And people back in those days, oh, you have a sore throat, what the heck, you know, no, no big deal. But, uh, I got Bright's disease over that, and I went to St. Francis Hospital, uh, which is right across then from uh, Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget it. He told my folks, he said, well, there's nothing we can do. Uh, I was 13 years old. He said uh, he, he may not make it. And in fact, uh, a kid in Madison at the same time, same age, died of Bright's disease, same mm -hmm. time I had it. Mm -hmm. But he said, we'll, just, we'll pour water down him, we'll take salt away, that's about all they can do. And uh, I was in the hospital probably two weeks, and uh, I remember, this is when I was only 13, but Verna and I knew each other, because she used to come to the hospital and see me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And anyway, I survived, but uh, when, I, when I got better, uh, I had been riding the bus from Cooch to uh, Summa, and uh, the doctor said, uh, you don't want to do that because there's too much jostling all around. So we, um, mom uh, and dad rented a house in Sumla, and uh, I can tell you right where it's at. And we lived there uh, all the rest of my eighth grade year. So you could go to school? Yeah. Nice. And uh, I was probably a, kind of a wise guy, probably a, an at-risk kid back in those days. They didn't call them, but that's probably what I was. And... Uh, I don't know if this is a good story for the video or not, but okay. I'll tell it. Okay, well, if it's not, I'll take it okay. out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I went to the um, ninth grade, and uh, and I had kind of a rough year, my eighth grade, but I mm -hmm. I failed Algebra 1. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mrs. White was a teacher, and, uh, and I, I'm sure I put almost zero effort into it, you know, because I was kind of a troubled kid. And she... Uh, I, I, I failed it, so I took it again mm -hmm. the second year. And at the end of the year, I was kind of a wise guy. I said, uh, I didn't learn anything new. And she said, well, you could always take it a third time. <laughs> and uh, the ironic thing about this whole story is that five years later, I came back and uh, took her job as a math teacher. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, as uh, and she was nice to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She it wasn't like you know, this jerk uh, taking my job, but but she was really really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's those uh, it's those unique kids that um, it's, they're worth it. Yeah, I, I just I always marvel at that story because uh, and, you know I went to uh, when I graduated from high school I went to uh, Colorado State University and graduated with math at Ed. And uh, Vernon and I were headed for Alaska. We were going to go teach in Alaska. And my dad had just bought the place where you're living right now. And he said, mm -hmm. well, 
Uh, oh, before that happened, though, uh, Lionel Robertson, who was at the Deer Picnic two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, he uh, called me up and he said, uh, we need a math teacher at Selma. Would you be interested? And I, uh, well, yeah, I hadn't thought of it, but we were kind of going to go to Alaska. But in the interim, my dad had just bought the place, and he said, I'll tell you what, he said, if you feed some cows and do some work for me, uh, I'll, you could live in the house rent-free. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, well, not a bad deal. So that's what I did. And it was, I taught math for five years. Nice. That's similar. And when I taught uh, my first year, it was the old building, uh, three-story brick building. And uh, I was in the upper northwest corner. That's where all the snow uh, blew in when it was blizzarding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the principal, who turned out to be a very good friend of mine, uh, took me to my room and he said, Here's your classroom. And he said, I think there's some textbooks in the back of the room in the closet there. And then he signed the door and I, I was on my own. <laughs> but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. My first year or two of teaching, I, I'm, I know I learned a lot more than my students, but uh, by year three, four, and five, um, I totally, thoroughly enjoyed teaching math nice. to high school kids. So, algebra. Yeah. Nice. It's the, it's the entry math. <laughs> now, the, uh, we went to a reunion a uh, couple, about a month ago, class mm -hmm. of 70, mm -hmm. and uh, I taught most of those kids. And they, I'd forgotten all about this, but they didn't for, forget. Uh, they said, you used to uh, tell us the answers are in the back of the book, and uh, go ahead and look at the answer and then figure out how you get to the answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got a big kick out of that, and I'd forgotten all about it. Yeah, well that's kind of the way to do it though, because then you, yeah. you, learn you learn the process. And I was kind of learning with them, and uh, well, although I, I was really good with algebra, but uh, geometry, I always struggled with that. And uh, eventually I, I enjoyed teaching geometry, because there's a, back in those days anyway, it was a lot of logic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one, I had this class, Algebra II class, and uh, uh, there were 11 or 12 kids in that class, and uh, they were motivated, and uh, I, by that time I knew how to teach math, and uh, they all took the PSAT test. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one day I was going from my classroom into the teacher's lounge to have a uh, cup of coffee or whatever, and the uh, superintendent, who was Dick Ullum, Mm -hmm. And Donna Collins, who was a counselor, they were standing right there at the main office door going into the lounge. And they looked at me and uh, they kind of grinned and they said, uh, have you seen the, the uh, PSA, PSAT scores in math? I said, no, no, I haven't. I, and I frankly wasn't interested because I, I wasn't doing it for test score things. Right. But they, uh, they said, well, you need to look at this. And uh, two kids uh, were in the 98th percentile three or four or five, I think we're in the 95th, 93rd percentile. The lowest kid in the class was in the 76th percentile in math. <laughs> and I, I think- So they learned something. They learned, That's but- awesome. uh, And I think I, I did know what I was doing teaching, but uh, the main thing is that they were incredibly motivated and competitive with each other. They worked mm -hmm. their butts off. <laughs> nice. Anyway, that's one of my side stories. <laughs> That's good. And what, so in that, what class was that? That was this, the reunion you just went to? Uh, no, uh, that class happened to be before. Mm. The, there was about 69 probably. Mm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. So that, by that time, you guys had a kid. Yeah. Yeah. We, we may have, Van was born in 75. Uh, no. So. Maury was born. Oh, yeah, Maury 75. Van was born in 66. Yeah, 66. And then Vaughn was? 69. 69. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good years. Yeah. It's, it's good that you were such a good teacher because you're probably tired with two little ones at home. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I, you know, doing really well as a teacher and uh, and uh, got along great with the kids and all that. One day, Mr. Olam, uh called me into his office. Well, I never get called into the superintendent's office. Yeah. So 
So I went in there and he said, uh, he said, we're going to have a, uh, an opening for a high school principal. No, K-12 principal. He said, uh, would you be interested? And, and I, I don't remember what I said, but I remember thinking, I don't know what the heck being a principal is all about. <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. Uh, and I was, I was making $5,250. That was my contract for teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, uh, he said, it's going to pay uh, $9,500. And that got my attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went home and uh, Vern and I talked about it. I said uh, to her, I said, my God, we'll be rich. <laughs> <laughs> so I took that job and uh, I actually had that job for 12 years as a K-12 principal. And then uh, I, my wonder lost for Alaska. Uh, and the way, the way my interest in Alaska came about uh, had to do with Simla and had to do with uh, Mr. Cowling, a teacher. And he asked me, uh, he said, do you want to, I'm going to drive up the Alaska Highway, do you want to go? And uh, mom and dad encouraged me, he said, yeah, dad needed me here to work, but he, he encouraged me, he wanted me to go. So I went and uh, we drove all through Alaska and I went to Circle Hot Springs up north and uh, we, we went through the uh, campus of the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, every hour, uh, on the hour, the uh, chimes rang throughout the campus and the uh, uh, landscape was beautiful. Flowers mm -hmm. everywhere. Everything was meticulous. And I just, the whole thing captured me. And I told my teacher, I said, uh, that's where I'm going to go to school. And I did. I went to school one year. Mm -hmm. And then I came back and Vern and I were married. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, that was uh, only three years after Alaska became a state. And the governor, William Egan, was the first governor of the state of Alaska. And he actually came to the campus of the University of Alaska. There was probably a couple hundred freshmen because there was only 1,400 students a whole. Uh, and he uh, made a speech to the uh, freshman class trying to get us motivated. And I remember him saying, uh, the, the future of Alaska is fantastic and there will be more opportunity here than you'll find anywhere. And you know, that kind of a speech. Mm -hmm. And he didn't even know about oil. Mm -hmm. Oh time. gosh, wow. And, uh, but, uh, and I remember, Calculus classes. I remember. Oh, I was uh, up there when uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, okay. And I remember being in a political science class. We spent all of our time talking about that for weeks. Uh, but anyway, then I came back, um, and I was principal for twelve years. Here. Here, and uh, and then we went to uh, Alaska. Again. Yeah. Again. So the first time you went to Alaska as as in the teaching position, not as a going to college as a student, well, the but second you went time up I was there quite north. In the Eskimo village. Right. Yeah. And was that Deering? No, at first it was Kivalina. Oh, Kivalina, that's right. And uh, there's a long story about that because uh, we, I had taken a year's leave of absence and I, I won't get into the, this is a long, fascinating from, from here. story. Yeah. I, uh, I applied for a packing plant uh, grant because uh, I had I had contacts with cattle ranchers uh, in Alaska and uh, I was trying to buy some we didn't have any money and uh, anyway I applied for a two and a half million dollar uh, interest free loan this was during all the oil time, mm -hmm. and they were trying to develop infrastructure and uh, I met uh, the guy that started Alaska Sausage and uh, Herb Ackman was his name and uh, I spent evenings with him and his wife and over the dinner table talking about, you know, the future of the beef industry. And but anyway, we I took a year's leave of absence and uh, we went to uh, um, Wasilla. In fact, the boys were in school with uh, Sarah Pale. Mm, and uh, anyway, the older two. I uh, I came in number two in the grant process, and the guy that came in number one uh, had. He was a Alaska mill and feed, and he had a lot of uh, political connections. I had none, mm -hmm. and but my I, I'm still convinced to this day that my proposal was ten times better than his, and had all the moving parts. And he knew nothing about cattle ranching or any of that kind of stuff. So anyway, we uh, we uh, that fizzled out. So Vern and I were just he was waiting tables, and I was driving the school bus, and we were waiting to go back to similar to my job, and. Uh, then I saw an ad in the paper where they needed a K-12 principal at Kivalina. Had no idea where Kivalina was. So I, I went up there for the interview. And, and, uh, and tell us where Kivalina is. 
Kivalina is uh, north of Kotzebue, about 60 miles, and a village of about 200 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I flew in there for the interview. They offered me the job and uh, came back. Bert and I talked about it. And uh, we went and bought the boys some parkas and we got kind of prepared. Because this is north. This is way like, north This is cold Alaska. Alaska. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we, we flew from Anchorage to uh, Kotzebue. And then we get in the small Islander airplane, and maybe five, six passenger, and uh, we took off. It was dark because it was December, mm -hmm. and uh, we see this speck of light up there. And the pilot said, "There's Kivalina," and uh, we uh, landed. And uh, they picked us up. A bunch of people picked us up on snow machines and sleds, and they dropped us off at our house because we were, we had rent-free housing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we went in the house, and it was uh, probably 40 below zero, and uh, the honey bucket, well, the only water was in a plastic garbage pail, and it was froze solid, and uh, the honey bucket was ru running over full and froze solid. Not, not everybody knows what a honey bucket is. A uh, honey bucket is what people used to go to the bathroom, <laughs> and uh, I got a lot of stories about that. <laughs> Tons of One of our stories. teachers in uh, Deering, and the teachers were all hired from down here and knew nothing about Eskimo living. And uh, this one teacher had a big steel pot that he'd used for a honey bucket. It was all froze, so he thought, well, before he goes to school, I'll put that on my stove and let it thaw out. So while he was gone, it thawed out and boiled over. <laughs> oh, yes. Anyway, I, I can tell stories forever. <laughs> Mismanaging your honey bucket is a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. But we had a, a Kivalina was kind of a rough time because it was the first time we ever um, lived in an Eskimo village. And uh, the boys uh, experienced racism. Uh, and they had to fight their way to and from school. I've always felt bad, but they, it, it really impacted their lives and, and maybe not in all a good way, but uh, I think it did teach them a lot about living with a different culture and so forth. But then uh, I thought, uh, George White was a superintendent and he came out, he was the um, graduation speaker. We had three girls graduate from high school. And he, uh, he said, uh, he put his arm around me and he said, we sure like to have you back here next year. And I remember thinking, there's no way in hell I'm going <laughs> to. So we came back and we were here for two years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the superintendent at Callahan, um, uh, Richard Simmons was his name, he was, he was going to go to Denver to uh, interview for a principal's job in the Northwest Arctic School District. And he thought maybe I should go along and maybe the connections might help him in some way. Mm -hmm. So I went uh, <coughs> I went with him and the, the interview was at the Brown Palace Hotel. And uh, I remember uh, in the bar, I, uh, I lifted up the phone and I, I called George in his room. Mm -hmm. and I said, oh, he said, uh, he said, bring me up a scotch and uh, we'll visit. So I got an hour uh, recess time. Said, Let, let's just uh, bring me up a scotch and we'll visit. So I did. And uh, while we were visiting, he said, uh, uh, I've got a great job for you uh, in Deering. And uh, I said, well, we're, we're really pretty settled in. And, uh, and I could go on about how that all transpired, but we ended up being in Deering uh, for three years. And, and that's where, is that where you met the Carmen family? Yes. Yeah. And Chuck Carmen was my... Um, Secretary, mm -hmm. and we I call the, the Carmens the Rockefellers of uh, Deering mm -hmm. because they they owned the reindeer herd and they had yeah know, the influence. And I got to meet her when we visited yeah. in Virginia one right. time. I really liked her. Oh, she's, well, <clears throat> uh, one time we were uh, we played a lot of poker because there wasn't much to do. So on a Friday night we'd go at somebody's house and play poker, and uh, so we we were playing poker and uh, uh, Mimi or. Uh, Eki Carmen, which is uh, Chuck's niece, she was going to have a baby. She was a high school, 16-year-old uh, high school girl. And they normally go to Cosby to have their baby. And, mm -hmm. But we had a raging blizzard going on, and, and uh, somebody knocked on the door. We were, you know, playing poker deep into that. And and they came in, and uh, they said, Eki's going to have her baby. And they were wanting some help. Well, there wasn't any help there. Mm -hmm. And so they left, and uh, uh, the health aide, because every village has a trained health aide, and she was drunk. 
And so Chuck, maybe, Barman, and Verna broke in to the, uh, the clinic mm -hmm. and took what they needed to get this baby born. Mm -hmm. And uh, so everything, everything turned out fine and the baby was born. And uh, uh, 20 years later, this is not very many years ago, uh, I get this phone call and I said, hello, uh, this is Jack Harmon. And I didn't mean anything to me at, at first. But he was the baby that uh, Vernon Chuck delivered in. Oh. He came out here. Neat. <laughs> and we had a long visit. And he's a nice young man. And... Nice. But he said, I want to talk to my Ottomom. And that's what they uh, mm -hmm. that's what he called Vernon, Ottomom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's neat. That is so neat. I've taken a lot of side trips uh, in all this discussion. But you know what? It's 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 neat. We could probably I should well I probably should have grabbed a pen and taken notes of what we were covering, but um, we might have to. Well, I know we're going to sit down at some point with Charlie, yeah. and uh, and he wanted to kind of just go over. You guys might between the mm -hmm. two of you have a lot of information to cover about Cooch, which I don't mm -hmm. think is listed on a map anymore. No. Um, but it used to be. Yeah. There was a there was a general post store. Post office. There was a post office. Yeah. There. Yeah. So the general store and the post office were in that mm -hmm. same building. Yeah. Where I think didn't Carrie live there? Um, or just no? Carrie, no. What was that? Not where Carrie Ashcroft. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. No. Um, but I th thought you know let's get that at some point. And Charlie called me today, and I we were kind of chatting, and I was like, oh, uh -huh. this would be a good chat to have. Uh, on r recording, yeah. because we were talking a lot about different people and, and dates mm -hmm. and places. Um, I need to tell you too that uh, the packing plant project that I had going, mm -hmm. uh, I was in Alaska doing my homework for that and uh, Leo and Charlie came up and mm -hmm. uh, Leo had some money and he was going to try to help me out. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so they, we spent probably a week, uh, Leo, Charlie and I, driving different places in Alaska. Neat. Yeah, I, I haven't been up there much, but what I've seen, I just loved because, you know, of course, I've grown up here and um, it's just so dry that I didn't really realize until I went up to Alaska that I would like to have more moisture in my life. Yeah. <laughs> my skin felt better. Yeah, my oh, hair yeah. had a little bit of wave to it. It was yeah. the weirdest thing. Yeah. And uh, I just was easier to breathe. You know, some local uh, stories that uh, you've probably heard this before, but uh, my granddad Rivers <clears throat> uh, told me this story several times because he wanted to make sure I didn't uh, forget it. But they moved here from Illinois. Uh, my grandmother was dying of tuberculosis, and the doctor said, if you don't get to a drier climate, you're not going to live another year. Mm -hmm. So they moved out here and uh, down by Cooch, and uh, they, uh, they started raising pinto beans because it just was a good pinto bean. In fact, they called it the Pinto Bean Capital of the World for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And my my granddad said uh, we had a really wet year. He said I had the, a beautiful Pinto Bean crop, and I harvested them. And I had uh, he had a kind of a little convenience store and in a big warehouse. And mm -hmm. uh, he said I I would walk into that warehouse and I would have I had Pinto Bean stack uh, sacks stacked to the ceiling and they're everywhere. He said I would walk in there, and look at all of that. And he said I said to myself. I'm a rich man because they were worth twelve dollars a sack. It was a lot of money back mm -hmm. in those days. And they said, but I thought I would wait till they got to be thirteen, and then I would load them up in the wagon and take them to uh, town. Uh, the depression hit, and uh, he had to sell them to the government for pennies, and mm -hmm. it broke him. He lost everything he had. And uh, another story. This is a pre. This is depression time. Mm -hmm. And about the same time, uh, my granddad, my mother's dad, uh, Everett Ashcraft, uh, he had raised quite a few beans and was doing really well and uh, had a lot of money in the Madison Bank. Mm -hmm. And people started getting nervous about banks. So he went up there uh, and took all of his money out in cash and put it in a coffee can and took it back to the place. And uh, that's where Carrie lives now. Mm -hmm where my Uncle Dale lived, and he buried that can. Mm -hmm. and, and my mom told this story multiple times because she was 16 years old and heard everything that was said. But she said uh, uh, he took all the money out of the bank, put it in a can, buried it. And uh, that a Sunday, on a Sunday, the two bankers drove out. 
and uh, they they were crying, and I said, "Ever, you've got to put that money back in the bank. The community depends on it, and everybody's going to be hurt if you don't do that." And by kind of a speech, so my granddad went back out and uh, dug up the can, gave it to the bankers. <coughs> that was Sunday. On Monday morning, uh, the bank uh, doors were locked, and uh, one one of the bankers shot himself. And that's just, those kind of things happened back in the mm -hmm. depression. So anyway, those are two stories I have that that uh, I remember hearing about. Yeah. Oh. Gosh, that's that's yeah. a cooch kind of a story because that, that's kind of where they yeah. raised the penalty. beans. Well, and the bank was in Matheson, huh? Mm -hmm. So there's not a bank in Matheson. Now, the building was a brick. I could still see it. It was a red brick building on a corner, and uh, it was torn down years ago. Mm-hmm. So Matheson doesn't have any businesses in it right now. Do they they have, a, have a post office. A post office, that's it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then Cinema has a grocery store and a butcher and a mechanic. Retirement home. Retirement home. Town hall. Yeah. But I think Cinema used to have, didn't they have a waterbed factory? That, and a machining... Yeah, when Nichols Tillage Tools uh, and Bill Nichols came here uh, with nothing but a tent and an anvil. And uh, that grew into uh, Nichols Tillage Tools. And he eventually uh, was employing about 60, 70 people in Selma. Oh, wow. And they were producing uh, tillage tools uh, that all people farm with. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, dis the business grew like that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and finally... Uh, they were having trouble getting steel in here, so they moved to Sterling, where they are at today. Is and, that because uh, the railroad moved? Yeah. And uh, his, uh, Bill Nichols' grandson runs a business now, and he was at uh, the alumni picnic a couple of years ago, and mm -hmm. one of my students, former students. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, the Simla, that was the biggest thing that ever happened. The Simla was nickel stillage tools. But they had two grocery stores at one time. They had two filling stations. They had a pharmacy. Uh, they had a pool hall. Mm -hmm. uh, they had three pool tables and sold beer. And if you want to go in there, a lot of people spent a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. And what else did they have? Oh, they had a, a beauty parlor. And uh, what else? There was, it was a, kind of a going well, proposition. There was a boarding school. Was it similar kind of where everybody sent their kids? Well, yeah, back in uh, my uncle Bub, who had the turkey farm down there, he uh, he boarded out. My dad never did go to high school, but Uncle Bub uh, moved to Simla and stayed in the boarding house and went to high school. Mm -hmm. right. So this was the school for the for the area. Area, right? So it wasn't real, and that is that why it was called the Big Sandy Schools. Because it was kind it of never, area. It never was called Big Sandy School until uh, Simla, Rama, uh, and Madison uh, consolidated and went into one school. Oh, okay. And then they changed the name to Big Sandy. Okay. In fact, when I was teaching, I think it was still called Simla. I know it was still called Simla School. All right. So the Big Sandy School is kind of a recent change, then? Very, very recent, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see, what else can we talk about? We used to. So when you you just referenced a little while ago that that you are up in the corner of a brick building, mm -hmm. so where in Simla was that school building? Right now it's kind of right north of the water towers, and there's a whole bunch of uh, trailer houses there now. But that's mm -hmm. where the the old brick building was. Okay. And then uh, I taught in there for probably two or three years, and then they built a new school, the Round Pods. The, the Pods. Yeah. In, in kind of the same location. Yeah. Okay. And I taught there for two or three years, and uh, that was, I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the, when we first were talking, you were talking about the hotel with the balconies. And that's, those are now the apartments, apartments mm -hmm. that are um, on County Road 125 as you're kind of heading north to go to Highway 86. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then, do you know where the waterbed factory was? It's where the uh, Dickles Tillage Tools was, and it's all the steel buildings. And okay. the uh, police, uh, uh, are, they're using the old office mm -hmm. building. And, and then the Conservation District uses those buildings, don't they? Isn't uh, that for where trees. you pick up your trees yeah. and stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah we used to, uh, uh, <clears throat> Vernon and I were 
teenagers, uh, we would go down that building where the school used to be, that pretty good size hill. And everybody, uh, the town cop, Bud Hutchers was his name, he would uh, cordon everything off and we would go down that hill for hours all day long and sleigh riding and we had snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be cool. That, that would be a good idea. Yeah. I have uh, unintentionally slid down that hill in my minivan that you picked me up several times because I couldn't get home when I had that minivan. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, we used to go from the school <clears throat> right at the top of the hill and go down that hill, the one that we were we slid going on, and uh, that's where we ate lunch every day. Mm -hmm. Go down the hill and have chili and, and uh, cinnamon rolls. Mrs. Glover, who... Uh, one of her sons still lives up at Callahan. We see him a lot, uh, Gary Glover. But uh, she was a cook, good, a heck of a cook. Back in those days, nobody took their lunch. I mean, everybody ate their lunch there. Hmm. Yeah. It's changed. Anyway, I, I kind of give you the highlights. I could tell you uh, side stories all day long and tomorrow. <laughs> And uh, that's a little bit beyond where we need to go, but uh, some of it was uh, uh, a going concern when I was growing up. And uh... well, they I don't I don't remember the when did the railroad move, but when the railroad was going through here, this was a a, a spot. This yeah. was this was kind of jumping. Yeah, uh, I don't remember much about the railroad. Vernon does because she grew up uh, by, down with the railroad track and uh, she used to be riding her horse and go like this and the conductor would honk her, his horn. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, and the railroad <coughs> started in 1988. And, uh, or 18. 1888, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> and uh, Milton Lamb, who passed away here a couple of years ago, he was at the... Uh, Good Samaritan Center, I think he was 94 when he passed away, mm -hmm. but uh, he used to tell me stories about uh, the train and about, you know, building the railway and all that kind of stuff, and uh, he remembers that quite well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, you you got to follow the trade traffic. Yeah. Which is, I guess is now the trucks. Well, the so. lift trap people that uh, started this ranch, uh, they owned all the land where Simla is, and uh, they actually sold it to Simla, uh, and for them to start a city. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, I think, in, in 1898 or somewhere about that time. Yeah. And then they, they had, there was nothing at Simla except a, they call it a siding. And that's where the train stopped and there were corrals and people drove their cattle in and uh, shipped them out. Nice. Okay. Huh. Well, that's interesting. I, I guess I hadn't caught that the lip trap sold the land to for for the town yeah. to even start. Yeah, we've got. Uh, I've got a whole box of uh, uh, information that we got out of the archives in Denver about mm -hmm. uh, the lip traps and about all of that. And then uh, Pioneer Museum has a lot of lip trap stuff. Mm-hmm. Neat. All right. So we're gonna have to revisit about. Cooch when we get with Charlie. Yeah. And maybe we'll add on to the, I'll probably edit this video into two videos because we kind of talked about Glenn Morris. Mm -hmm. And we'll put his information about the medals. Yeah. And, and maybe I'll go up and take some pictures up at the school yeah. of that display. Yeah. And kind of make a, a bundle of Glenn mm -hmm. Morris information. And then, yeah. It's a good information. Yeah. Well. We just got started. I yeah. Know. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Berbers, for sharing with us about Simla, being a young teacher uh, and a young principal between Simla, Colorado, and a few different locations up in Alaska. It's been really awesome to hear about your life as a as a young man growing up, raising a family, and just hearing the differences in the Simla that you raised your family in and the Simla that I'm raising my family in. And it's really nice to celebrate that history and to celebrate the differences. So I'm really glad that you took the time to talk with me and, um, and we will be doing it again. For all those watching, 
If you know someone in our local area that has a lot of history and that would be willing to sit down with me and share, give me a comment, give me a Facebook Messenger me, whatever. Let me know those people and if they'd be willing to sit down and record some oral histories, we would love, love, love to do it. So, all right. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Bye.